Welcome back to Aleta Ya Human. I'm Vivi Guyfront. It is for me a true pleasure to have you today with us. As executive coach and cultural promoter, I will guide today's podcast to a reflection that came to me while walking in the gardens taken care of by my great aunt. She showed me this beautiful flower called Narcissus. And I was immediately stricken by her beauty, the white petals, the deep yellow center, and this kind of grace, grace in the wind. So this flower invited me to a meditation. First, because of how beautiful and how straight she stands in the wind with a pure white petal and deep yellow center, but also how frail and petite she really looks. Such a tiny flower for such an important myth full of weight. Why am I saying it's full of weight? Well, when we hear of Narcissus in history, we are very likely to recall Freud's, Dr. Freud's conception of it. Actually, it began with Otto Rank in 1911. He published the first psychoanalytical paper specifically concerned with narcissism, linking it to vanity and self-admiration. Then, Sigmund Freud published a paper exclusively devoted to narcissism in 1914 called or narcissism, two points, an introduction. Narcissus is associated to nowadays to a state of egocentrism, vanity and self-admiration. But actually there is a whole other story behind it. A beautiful one, actually. One that we inherit from 2000 years of history. In Greek mythology, Narcissus was a hunter from Tespaia, who was known for his beauty. He was a hunter who loved everything beautiful. Narcissus was proud in that he disdained those who loved him, causing fun to take their own life to prove that devotion to his striking beauty. Several versions of the myth have survived from ancient sources. The most renowned version is by poet Ovid in his book Metamorphosis. This is the story of Echo and Narcissus, and I will read you a brief summary for you to understand. One day Narcissus was walking in the woods when Echo, a mountain nymph, saw him and fell deeply in love and followed him. Narcissus sensed he was being followed and shouted, Who's there? Echo repeated, Who's there? She eventually revealed her identity and attempted to embrace him. He stepped away and told her to leave him alone at once. She was heartbroken and spent the rest of her life in lonely glens. Nothing but an echo sound remained of her. Nemesis, the goddess of revenge, noticed this behavior after learning the story and decided to punish Narcissus. Once during the summer, he was getting thirsty after hunting and the goddess lured him to a pool where he leaned upon the water and saw himself in the bloom of youth. Narcissus did not realize it was merely his own reflection and fell deeply in love with it as if it were somebody else. Unable to leave the allure of his image, he eventually realized that his love could not be reciprocated and he melted away from the pyre, fire of passion burning inside him, eventually turning into a gold and white flower. Back to our flower. The flower symbolizes an unreciprocated love from Echo at the consuming love of oneself by Narcissus. 
Our conception of Nazism is of course marked by Freud's legacy and his definition of Nazism being a stage where persons are truly blocked at the stage where they just, you know, enjoy their own mirror reflection and think that this mirror reflection is somebody else. Narcissus is the origin of the term narcissism, a fixation with oneself and one's physical appearance or public perception. When reading this, I was left wondering two things. First, in these times of massive communication and the era of selfies, how much are we victim of our own narcissism? And how much does it forbid a deeper and truer interest in the, of the others? Empathy is the broad concept that refers to the cognitive and emotional reactions of an individual to the observed experiences of another. So, how much can we observe the experiences of the others if we are under the spell of our own reflection? If we are under the spell of narcissism, are we able to experience any empathy at all? That is my first question to you. But then something else came into mind. Something that might not come as easily to understand at first hand when we hear about narcissism and we do recall Freud's way of seeing it as a blockage in a stage, as a way of not having advanced enough. I was wondering, is narcissism something that we really have to fight against at all costs? Or is it also part of the equation in solving our biggest challenges? Given that our biggest challenges are yet to come, the challenges that we already know are the pandemic and probably the economic crisis that is coming. But there is disruption already in the work force and there will be challenges for us to cope with and to evolve with. So maybe it is time for us to wonder how we can use Narcissus legacy better. Maybe Narcissus legacy can help us strengthen our inner core as we try to understand how we can be part of others' destiny. It makes sense. As you see reflections from the awakening of the spring, from the senses, from the meditations, can be also an invitation of thinking our own inner core. How can we transfer ourselves? How we, can we get stronger so to be able to better help the others? How can we serve our own interests while being a positive influence for the others? How can we grow while paying a fortuity for the others? How can we evolve and become a better version of ourselves while being helpful for our colleagues, friends, neighbors, families? I think that these complicated times have given us also the possibility, the time, maybe the reflection needed to get different perspectives on societal challenges and on our destinies. And this, at the end, is what I would like Aletheia Human to be for you. An option of being things differently, of enriching ourselves from culture, of learning from past, from mythologies, from great authors and of grasping our best road into 
getting a better version of ourselves.